update his CV, he's had a lunch since you've seen him. And has answered a series of questions in sample size calculation, presumably. So John is going to talk on common pitfalls and how to avoid them. The first one being, don't agree to do two talks. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Absolutely right. And uh, um, the title of this, this talk, it sounds like it's going to be one of those whingy talks where there's going to be, and don't do this and don't do that. And do, so I'm going to try and uh, sidestep that completely by, right, with the premise saying that uh, everything we do here is through collaboration. And I'll finish on talking about collaboration. If you have a statistician collaborating with you, a lot of this shouldn't matter. It shouldn't arise. But part of it then is to spot examples in papers that suggest that collaboration hasn't happened. So let's see how this is. So I'm going to talk about statistical best practice. We're used to uh, <coughs> medical best practice, clinical best practice. So statistical best practice of what to look for. So what do you need to look for in a paper to suggest that this is, that provides evidence that this has happened. <coughs> Second part then is we talked about sample size and we talked about recruitment and I want to talk a little bit about when n is too large. When does it happen, and when does it happen that the sample size might be too large? And this is getting into the sort of the big data relevant problems there. I'll open a data set that relates to research that's carried out here in a, a, a school of nursing in midwifery. I've got to hide the context to you, and I want you to try and decide on what you think is going on. Okay. So statistical best practice. This is my definition. A, <clears throat> what I think statistical best practice. So research that changes practice mandates the highest standards in design and analysis. That's why we're here today. Completed by highly trained researchers, that's everybody in front of us, but communicated effectively to multiple audiences. So the statisticians often let themselves down here and that we don't have the translational component. We often work in very methodologically a complex things and we present the results and we say, there you go, best of luck, translate that to who you want to translate to. So this piece becomes very important. So let's look at poor statistical practice. And then I'm going to give you some ideas as to where this happens. Now, there's a lot of evidence that this is very prevalent. So there's a growing body of literature that talks about, if anybody who likes looking at retracted papers, there's a website called retractwatch.com. And they list all the papers that are retracted and they give all the reasons why. And I've lifted that slide from there. So a lot of the reasons that our paper's been retracted, I think within med something like 48% within clinical research, and within that, the, the, the vast region of the, the, the majority of reasons was due to a, a poor statistical analysis, poor design, predominantly poor analysis. So concerns relating to the statistical analysis. And this is a nice paper to look at. This is not where we want to be. Having retracted funding, run our trial, that we're in some notion where this happens. Okay, so what to look for? I've got four different pieces. Study design. We've had a lot of really, really excellent talks this morning already about study design. Pieces that uh, just, just sloppiness here in numerical and graphical summaries and why that's important. Remember I mentioned this part, whatever paper you get is what you need to help design your trial. So make sure this stuff is sensible. Some parts in analysis and some parts in report, reporting. So it's study designs. Study aims and primary outcomes clearly stated. This is what we'd like to see. The sample size calculation should be reproducible. Everything gave a lovely description about reproducibility of the randomization scheme. Well, the sample size calculation should be reproducible. Any statistician or anyone competent to reproduce the sample size should have all the information there to get that same number. If not, that's a concern. Typically, the standard deviation is hidden here. Methods of randomization and blinding clearly described. Numbers and reasons for withdrawals reported by treatment. So a complete flow. The design, sample size, how did the randomization, how was it carried out, <coughs> and then they, uh, why did people drop out? So numerical and graphical summaries. Typically what in statistics? We want some measure middle, typical. We statisticians talk about middle, typical. Everybody else talks about mean. This notion that the mean is always the middle. The mean is one of various measures of middle. So we need middle and we need variability. <coughs> So appropriate statistical measures for those things. People often put in this standard error. So the standard error gives me more of an indication about the precision of my statistic as a guess of the parameter. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the variability in the observations themselves. So I want the variability in the data, not in the precision. I can get this thing as a consequence of that, but it's very hard to work backwards in a lot of cases, unless I'm using the pieces I need. So I want the variability itself. This, of course, was key for the sample size calculation. The idea that you would use the mean all the time to measure middle. So think of this example. 
Here's some data where it looked at the step count. Some trial was looking at step count. An intervention was going to be put in place, say a phone-based intervention, a phone app to improve step count. And there was some idea, the record of baseline said what? The typical value is reported by the mean 1,000 steps and the standard deviation 600. Why is that a concern? Why could that not make any sense? <coughs> right, so if we start, if there's an argument here about once I've reported the mean and the standard deviation, this, this, that, that suggests that, that symmetry was in place because it makes sense to talk about the standard deviation where you have symmetry. And then you said, what, go a couple of multiples of a standard deviation each side should be most of the people. Go two standard deviations each side, 95% of the individual step counts are a negative. So that can't make sense. That has to have been positively skewed data. So a better measure there might have been the median or the mode or something else. <coughs> okay, so the idea is don't just generate these things out because standard practice is we look at the mean, we look at the standard deviation. The average salary amongst people who watch Chelsea play is around 30,000 starting a week. When Abramovich turns up, they're all millionaires on average. It makes absolutely no sense. So any values, any outliers, any strange things makes this completely redundant. This is only a useful measure when we have the gift from Gauss, we have some symmetric distribution. This drives all statisticians nuts. Plus or minus a standard deviation. It's a mean bracket standard deviation. Plus or minus what? Is that plus or minus one standard deviation? 68% of observations, so what? So brackets, mean bracket standard deviation. Summaries often, you'd see summaries to three and four levels of decimal, and you've collected the thing to a two decimal. So you're pretending you have more precision than you had, and that's just sloppy reporting from statistical software. <coughs> Okay, there's a nice picture a student sent to me when I was giving a rant about the mean and the standard deviation. He bought a box of runners in a uh, somewhere in the States. So that's what was on it. So my guess is you want to know the standard deviation here and you want the standard deviation to be zero. Yeah. <laughs> or take a risk, you're going to get more or less used in the thing. <laughs> these kind of plots have become very popular, especially in bioinformatics. So statisticians don't like these. This is a plot of the mean. We tend to use bars when it's a frequency. We don't like to represent a mean by a bar, but they, for some reason this has become popular. And this is some measure of variability. Typically the standard deviation, sometimes the standard error. You eyeball those and you <coughs> suggest what? A and B look similar, C and D look similar, but collectively A and B look different to C and D. Well, they're the data used to generate those plots. So they're the raw data themselves. First, we have 15. 15 observations creating a box plot isn't such a bad thing. There's the median, I'm getting some idea of symmetry. The second, even though it gave the identical mean, simulated up two observations, and likewise here. So don't hide anything. The idea is if you have a small amount of data, just show the data. If you have lots of data, maybe give some picture that represents both the spread, middle, and where half of your observations are. So we call these dynamite plunger plots, because the idea is you're blowing up any information that you may have. <laughs> this is giving you no more difference than what you get in a table. That's a mean standard deviation, nothing else. You just put the table in a graphical form. Show us the data. Show the raw data. Don't show the data from the analysis you did, because that's lovely and fixed now. It's adjusting for all the things if that model was true and everything looks nice. Show the messy. Show what it is you were given to play with, or analyze. Play is probably the wrong verb. Okay, what to look for. So some may problems in data analysis. Poorly written analysis plans. We will adjust for something as appropriate. Yeah, I mean that, that's very useful. So poorly written analysis plans. Jessica made a wonderful point about if you have some stratification in there, you need that in your analysis plan. You have designed a priori that this structure is there in the population, you need to adjust for it. And there's, there was this, there's still this push that normality of the data, that I, you know, I tested for normality on the basis of this, I made this decision or not. So there's two parts here. One is that if you're fitting a model, that doesn't matter. Because there's going to be so much variability you're going to explain with the components in the model. What's left over, nice, that has to be nice and normal. But the variable itself doesn't. Unless you're looking at an analysis of a single variable where normality is needed. The other part is the idea that this is a, a totally sensitive, a perfectly sensitive test. That it tells you whether something came from a normal distribution or not. The second part, of course, is it's not that your sample is normal, it's did it come from a population that was normal. So there's this stuff appears everywhere, it's kind of the standard line, I tested for normality, and then everything I did was on the basis of a t-test and a chi-squared test. So one of the biggest contributions in statistics in Ireland, here it is. But I mean, this is the idea that every analysis you can do can be based on these two things. It's probably not a great idea. 
every radio advert finishes in really fastly spoken terms and conditions are blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it's the same in statistics. Everything we apply would have some underlying assumption, possibly normality. But we need to validate those. We're always told there isn't enough space in the paper for you to put that in. So maybe the appendix or some supplement, the statistician, if they were doing their job correctly, would put in all of the assumptions that were needed to be validated and whether they were or not. The, thankfully, this is, this is less prevalent, where there was this idea that after baseline, so I mean, we have randomization of two groups, and we test did randomization work. And the idea being, if it's not significant, things are equal. Clearly not, because evidence are not different. That's not the same as equal. And if we randomize off lots of things, something that's up as significant, we think, oh no, randomization hasn't worked. Clearly it has. If you're testing over a one in 20, you've got so many things that baseline is bound to be some things that come as up. The idea is adjust for these in your model. Don't randomize, think all's well, and then ignore that information. Build it into your model. As Eric has said, build it in then as part of your analysis plan. I talked about hypothesis tests this morning. That's the way the, me the mechanics of how these are carried out. But it makes much more sense, as you know, to estimate something. P-values are a quasi-motor approach to, to statistics. It's bell ringing. Has something happened, yes or no? Interval estimates tell me what I'm trying to measure and how precisely I can measure it. My full hypothesis test is given by looking at the values in the interval because they tell me the values that data supports. So I can do all the hypothesis tests by looking at that interval estimate if I need. One-tail tests are very rarely appropriate. But you can call it a priori that this is the only direction I'm interested in. I'm over my winch, I'm nearly done, and then we'll play with some data. So inappropriate filtering, and this is the idea of subsetting. This is the idea that you go in and you find a subset. Isn't that interesting that this happened here? Now a student picked me up on this before and he said, hang on a second, had I declared that subset before the analysis, I would have got the exact same results. And you're saying now that you got that result which you can't mean it doesn't mean anything. And I'd say, of course it means something, but I can't make claims behind it. And he said, I would have got the same result. And then luckily for me, in the corner of the room, there was a bin. And I picked up a piece of paper, and I threw it over my shoulder, and I hit the corners and landed in the bin. And the class were like, and I said, no, no, I meant to do that. And they said, no, you didn't. That's a complete clue. I said, no, that's interesting. I said, had I declared it beforehand, and that happened, would you have believed me? Yes. It's happened, and I'm claiming it. And then he goes, okay. <laughs> so we have to be careful. Very good selection team. So there's, 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 there's a lot of... Recent literature about this, some people call this you know, statistical or a statistical train wreck or car crash, and the idea that you're using your data to suggest variables that should be in the analysis. When you haven't designed your trial to have sufficient power to detect those things. So we always get concerned if we see a table of results and we don't see some variables in the model that aren't significant. There will be explanatories we know affect outcome, but may not come up as significant in the analysis you did because of the size. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've decided gender isn't important or age isn't important. We still need to adjust for these things. So be careful. This is the data-driven stuff we don't like to get. And that's my point. Pseudo-replication. 100 observations on one mouse is not the same as 100 mice each giving one observation. And this happens a lot also, where the inference now is on that one mouse. We have no between mouse variability. Large p-values. You see a p-value close to 1. You toss the coin 100 times, you get exactly 50 heads. That's a concern. So large p-values usually means something has gone wrong somewhere. You're <coughs> estimating something, and it's so little precision of what you've estimated. The standard error is so big, the p-value is huge. It's usually a consequence of model misspecification, not that there was nothing going on there. How missing data were handled. This has made statisticians even busier now. We now have to do the analysis not only of what we saw, but by using multiple interpretation of things we should have seen. So it's becoming a lot more complicated. But, but I mean, this makes sense. Missing this will happen. We saw that in the last talk. You say very precise language, so risk, people looking, jumping between what they think a risk and a probability is, jumping across to a nod, thinking your probability is the same as a nod, talking about ratios of those things and hiding differences by ratios, a, getting confused between a difference in means and a mean difference, the idea of a multivariate model, lots of y's, a multivariable model, lots of x's. This is just things that we spot as statisticians to say, does it look like this has been done correctly? What's coming up now and a concern for us is that, now this would be a shock to the people in the regulatory world who work in device industries and things like that. A lot of academic trials now are going through the exact same rigor, thankfully. But there's still a pressure on us often to release that in mid-trial. 
because the PI needs it often because there's a, a, um, a conference paper or a presentation or something. But we try and explain you can't get these down. You may have some interim look plan that we may look at variability, but you cannot look at the outcome. And they bang the table and say, we have a conference next week and I think this, and we say you can't have it, and then we're under pressure for not giving it. See, the analogy here is there's a football match on, 90 minutes, or 96 if you're a Man United fan. So there's a football match on, and you have to call the score. Six minutes in, it's 1 0. Do you call the game over now? 15 0 after six minutes, possibly. It's 1 0 <coughs> not. But the idea is if you're going to make that call mid trial, you better have protected yourself through whatever your significance level adjustment, whatever interim piece the statistician has worked with. So putting pressure on the data in mid-trial is not helping anybody. But we get the flack back that we're not being helpful. Okay, so the last part of this then is about large data. So this is getting into the space when we talked about what's the minimum sample size we can get. Often now with registry, we can get our access to huge amounts of data. And that, that would sound like great, huge data all as well, but not necessarily so. So here's two statements, and I lifted these up, Paul Rosenbaum's excellent book on design and observational studies. He says, in practice, design ends and analysis begins when outcomes are examined for individuals who would be the basis of the study's conclusion. That's a nice description of what design. What happens in observational studies? He said, if they begin by examining outcomes, it's a formless and disciplined investigation that lacks design. So I'm looking at outcomes, and then I'm trying to work backwards. That's like the same thing in some sense, in terms of what I just described as throwing something over my shoulder. Last biblical reference of the day. So Matthew foresaw the problems we were for, foresaw. Well, he, yeah, thank you. The problems that we're going to get in big data. So he's asking, it will be given to you, seek, and you will find, knock in the door, and it will be open to you. So I'm going to give you one quick look at a data set. And this data relates to nursing here. So it's, I'm not going to tell you the context. I'm not going to tell you the names of the variables. I'm going to show you a few pictures. And this is about missing the big picture. And I want you to come up with or have some idea as to what you think is going on here. So there's a matrix plot of a selection of variables in there. And it looks like what? There's some clustering going on here. It looks like there's a lot of lots of, yeah, I haven't told you the names. So some clustering. There seems to be about three or four clusters going on here in this data set. There's two of them, just to get an idea. So this is something measured on a continuous scale, not to 200, not to whatever. And there seems to be clusters. And there seems to be the distribution. And for this particular variable, it seems to have these humps, but much more on that one. Now, if we had time, I could ask you to explore out what you think this might mean from the context of nursing and midwifery. I'm not. I'm just going to show you one other plot and then the data. A screen plot. So now I'm looking at, I've looked at what underlying structure might be here. And a factor analysis suggests, again, about three or four components are explaining most of the information in this data set. But let's look at the data themselves. I've shown you summaries, I haven't shown you the data. Here are the data. I've color coded each cell by the magnitude of the value. So it's like a heat map. The data set is huge. You can only see a piece of it. So I'm going to zoom in and let's see what we get. <laughs> so Declan, you've just become a data set. So I took in Declan's picture and just got a, a pixel strength off each of the different uh, components of a, uh, his picture himself. So the idea here is be very careful. Just because we have large data doesn't necessarily mean they were out of trouble. Well, he's, he's very good. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So the summary and the conclusion here is that if you want to avoid statistical all of these pitfalls, collaboration is your key. And I know this has been a shout out now from the different statisticians here. And the problem is, and Erica, you'll agree with this, we're often brought in where the idea of playing the role of the um, the uh, <coughs> coroner, isn't it, that we're telling people what their study died of. And that's not a nice position to be in, and there's been such amazing work done to that stage. So collaboration is key. <coughs> Consulting a statistician has to take place at the beginning. Collaboration has to be based on mutual respect. Remember that statisticians have the same level of training in their discipline. There was this notion that it's always a service, and we're always told these things with like, oh, I need someone to do my this, or do my stats, or whatever. So biostats is both the primary and an enabling discipline. Statisticians work in their own space, but the space that we work in then, and the fun part is in the collaboration. So my advice on avoiding these statistical pitfalls is have the skill set to identify where you think it's happened, but the main message from that is find a statistician early on as part of your collaboration team, then the onus is on them to do the job correctly.